Uh, one, one of the biggest problems that we face in our society today is living life on the surface. Instead of taking time to reflect deeply about the purpose of our life, our true identity, our values, our brokenness, our relationships, we're often content living shallow and superficial lives on the surface, a life driven by the culture outside of us and compulsive emotions inside of us. And there's nothing that will reinforce life on the surface better than busyness. Granted, some seasons of life are busier than others. Some people have more active personalities than others. And sometimes uh, we are, we're, we're dealing with powerful external forces that pressure us to stay busy. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a boss that expects you to work unrealistic hours or uh, or a friend that wants to constantly do things. But busyness is not always forced upon us by the outside. And we know this because there are times when we have a real choice. And instead of sitting in solitude and silence for that kind of deep pondering, that deep reflection, we often fill it with frenetic activity. And as we reflect about this, I, I often wonder, why is, this, why is this the case? It's almost as if we're terrified of silence, terrified of being alone, terrified of being still. And I believe that there are lots of reasons for this, but one certainly has to do with our culture. In America, we live in a culture that largely measures human worth by profit-based productivity. The more you produce in the marketplace, the more valuable that you are. And in order to produce, you have to keep yourself busy with work. In addition to creating workaholics, this mentality also leads us to undervalue those that we see as less productive members of society, children, the elderly, the disabled, and the unemployed. In a culture obsessed with productivity, the idea of blocking off time to stop striving and producing so that we can go deeper in life is seen at best as a waste of time. And even worse than that, those who block off time in their calendar for that kind of stillness and um, doing nothing are often seen as lazy and immoral. So our culture rewards busyness and oftentimes punishes us for taking time off to be still and to stop our striving and producing. Another reason that I think we get lost in busyness is because it distracts us from our deepest anxieties. The minute we stop our frenetic activity and sit in silence, we get a glimpse of what's really going on deep inside of us. And if we don't like what we see, it can be very scary. I had a friend, I won't mention his name in case he watches the video on YouTube, uh, but I have a friend who said that his wife can't sit still for two minutes without feeling like she just wants to jump out of her own skin. There's so much anxiety underneath the surface, and the busyness is what distracts and consoles. So when we stop our producing and we sit in silence and we, we go deep inside of us, we might be confronted with some really uncomfortable feelings. We might see some brokenness that we need to deal with or some character defect that needs to change. Whatever the case may be, as we sit still and let go of all of our busyness, as we go deep, go inward, we often experience overwhelming sense of anxiety. And we like to run into the safety of distractions and consolations. The distraction and consolation of compulsive activity. Just stay busy. But most of us know who have tried to use this strategy that it doesn't work. 
Because busyness never heals our anxiety. It only pushes it deeper inside of us. It causes us to repress it. And anything that we repress and refuse to deal with is eventually going to come out sideways in self-destructive acts and attitudes. Of course, God knows all of this and makes our healing possible in part by calling us to a life of prayer, a unique kind of prayer that is called either contemplation or meditation. So take, for example, Psalm 63, 6. The psalmist says, I think of you on my bed and meditate. I meditate on you in the watches of the night. And then we read in Psalm 119, 148, My eyes are awake before each watch of the night that I may meditate, meditate on your promises. If you read the story of Elijah, you see that he spent many a nights alone in the desert learning to listen for the still small voice of God, which would have required him to have some time of solitude, stillness, and quiet. And in the New Testament, Jesus calls us by his own example over and over and over again to the practices of solitude, silence, and contemplation. If you don't believe me, just go back to the Gospel stories and look at how often Jesus is withdrawing from the crowds and going to a quiet place by himself to pray. Oftentimes this happens when Jesus has really done something in his life that was incredibly draining. Do you have those experiences where you have to do things that just sap away all of your energy and all of your passion and you're left just feeling empty? There are times where Jesus was giving and giving and giving and he had to withdraw into a quiet, lonely place in order to recharge his spiritual batteries. And other times he prayed before he had to tackle a really, really big challenge in his life. Like before he turned his face to Jerusalem and walked toward his death on the cross, he withdrew from even his closest friends in the Garden of Gethsemane for a time of solitude and prayer and reflection. Of course, the, the goal of meditation in the Christian tradition is spending time with God and doing that in a way that we can hear His voice. And this includes both a negative and a positive aspect. On the negative side, it requires detachment. We detach from the world around us in solitude and silence, and we descend deep into our hearts. We experience in this way, a kind of emotional clearing. Have you ever been hiking in the woods at night? There's been a full moon. And and as you're walking through the woods, there are these trees that are blocking almost all the light and you have to use a flashlight. But, But then imagine that you came to the end of a path and it opened up into this big clearing And the full moon was so bright that it illuminates that space as if it were daytime. Have you ever had that kind of experience and you're struck by awe of the light? And that's kind of what we're aiming at when we detach in contemplation or meditation. We detach from the world to kind of create a clearing, a sacred space where we can wait upon the Lord. On the positive side, it's a new kind of attachment. In that sacred clearing, we encounter the presence of God. And in Christian meditation, unlike many forms of Eastern meditation, detachment and emptiness are not ends in themselves. So if you've ever studied Buddhism or, uh, or other kinds of meditative practice, The idea is that detachment is the end that you're seeking. And in fact, in Buddhism, it's the practice of meditation is to detach from the world over and over again so that eventually, uh, when you die, you can escape the vicious circle uh, of, of reincarnation 
and be liberated by having your life simply extinguished. And the way that some Buddhist masters, at least some Zen masters, explain it is like your life is a candle and the goal is to extinguish the flame. And then you're out of the cycles of reincarnation. And so in Buddhist meditation and other forms of meditation, detachment and emptiness are an end in themselves, but that is not the case in Christian meditation. We seek detachment from the world so that we can more deeply attach to God in prayer. We descend into silence so that we can ascend into the glorious presence of God. We empty ourselves of ego so that God has room to build a sacred, tab- a sacred tabernacle in our hearts so that we might be more filled. There might be room in our hearts to be more filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so we meditate to cultivate a deep and intimate relationship with God, to have communion with God, to spend time with God, which transforms our interior life and empowers us to live more faithfully. You ever watch the shows where they buy these dilapidated homes and fix them up and flip them? When they first walk into the house, many of these homes are in utter disrepair. It takes time, doesn't it? It takes time and money. They have to invest lots of things into this home in order to slowly rebuild it or put it back together or remodel it to get it to to increase its value in order that it might be sold and they can make a profit. And I think that one of the reasons why we don't like meditation, one of the reasons we don't like to sit in stillness is that oftentimes we get a glimpse of our inner life and it looks like that dilapidated house. And when we get a glimpse of that, sometimes we're overwhelmed and we feel like there's no way that I can fix this one up. It's helpless. That's the anxiety that I was talking about. But isn't it interesting that the very thing that we're terrified of is the cure that God provides to heal us. The last thing we want to do is sit in silence and look on the inside and see everything that is in disrepair. But that's precisely what we need to do so that the Holy Spirit can begin to shine a light in dark places and show us the full scope of the work that needs to be done. And then we're reminded that we don't serve a critical, harsh God, a taskmaster driving us to meet quick deadlines, but we serve a God who loves us as a father loves a child, as a mother loves a child. And that as we begin this process of rehabilitating the inward tabernacle of our hearts, that we do it in a presence of grace and love and patience. We can begin to put things back together again. Meditation done consistently with the other spiritual disciplines is intended to have a cumulative effect. It is intended to transform us from the inside out so that we don't look the same five years from now or ten years from now, but that something feels different and looks different because it is different. In communion with God, our broken hearts are gradually healed of their hurts. Our fears are eradicated. And we're given wisdom to find our next best step, whatever that might be. Regular meditation, in the words of Paul, helps us to grow up in our faith, to mature so that we don't remain children in our faith. Meditation helps us as it says in James chapter 4, to have a grounded, centered life that is no longer tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. It is here where we get deep abiding, reliable wisdom that helps us to fend off all of the unreliable guidance that's constantly impinging upon our spiritual lives. Instead of 
being overpowered by the floodwaters of our circumstances with compulsive reactions, knee-jerk reactions. You know what I'm talking about? Yep, you're in church, don't lie. We all know what that's like, right? We get triggered and we have a knee-jerk reaction. And at that point, we're not being driven by our values. We're not being driven by the Holy Spirit. We're being driven by ego. But instead of being overpowered by the floodwaters of our circumstances with compulsive reactions, in meditation, we come to inhabit a safe space of inner peace out of which we can respond, not react, respond with divine wisdom. Other people's opinions of us as well as our own critical monologue, begin to lose power. Because what becomes most important is listening to God and pleasing God. In all of this, we come to see that life is much better on the deep end of prayer and meditation than on the surface with busyness. So how do we meditate? Um, some of you are familiar with the literature. Maybe you've read some Henry Nouwen, Thomas Merton, Richard Rohr. These are uh, figures that are releasing lots of books these days. Uh, one of the classics is Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, which is an overview of all of the different spiritual disciplines. But, but many of us have not had any teaching on meditation. And the only thing that we know is what we hear through the mass media that comes through, for example, Eastern practice or some, some, sometimes yoga classes. There are Christian yoga classes. I go to yoga every week. It's nothing to be scared of. But, um, but there is a difference between meditation uh, in, in Hinduism and meditation in Christianity. And it's important to the difference between those two things and to make sure that the prayer that you're focused on is your prayer with God. But many of us haven't had any real teaching in the church on Christian contemplation and meditation. And um, so I want to conclude this morning by just offering a few suggestions that might point you in the right direction if this is a spiritual discipline that you're interested in pursuing. First of all, I want to encourage you to receive as a gift any moments of solitude that you have throughout the course of your day. Despite our best efforts to fill up our time with frenetic activity, we occasionally stumble upon moments of solitude and we become aware of that. Maybe it's early in the morning when you're still lying in bed and everyone else is asleep or when you're having your morning coffee before beginning work or when you're in the car stuck in traffic. You know, moments in, uh, in which you become aware that it's not filled with busyness. Maybe you're walking down the beach and you're struck by the beauty of the sunset. Whatever the case might be, during these times, fight the compulsion to fill the space with noise and activity. Fight the compulsion to, instead of, maybe instead of changing the radio station, turn it off and have quiet and use it to pray. Um, as you're walking down the beach and you're struck by the beauty of the sunset, instead of, instead of filling your mind with racing thoughts about the next job that you have to do and how crazy your life is, take a deep breath and surrender it and say, God, I just want to be in your presence for a few minutes. Just stop. Sit still wherever you are and be silent. Observing silence. And in those moments, attending to the presence of God will prepare you for more specific, specific and focused times of meditation, which is the second suggestion, that you set aside a little bit of time every day. Early in the morning, for me, is best, but any time that you can break away for five or ten minutes of uninterrupted silence will do. And um, it's also helpful to designate a place where you go to meditate, a place where you return. Some people dedicate a room in their house as a prayer room or, or even a closet. I, I know um, someone at one of my previous churches, they had a big walk-in closet and she actually went out, her name was Mary, she went out and bought a kneeler, like you use at weddings, that, that, that she could actually go into the closet and kneel down and had a little table in front, put some candles up, an icon that she really liked. 
Um, so some people designate a room in the house or a corner in the house. Other people are in a home with lots of others and it feels like craziness and chaos and the only time that you're going to be able to have any peace is when you go somewhere else. Maybe go to one of your favorite parks or to the beach or somewhere where you can get away from all of the noise. Your posture doesn't matter as long as you're comfortable. You know, we see the picture. You don't have to sit in the lotus position or you know, go like this when you're praying. I mean, you can if, it, if you feel like it brings you closer to God. But, um, but I meditate laying down in the bed because that's where I'm most comfortable. You don't want your body to be aching and distracting you. You want to be completely relaxed so that you can focus on whatever God's given you to meditate on, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And it's also helpful to get a meditation timer because we're so consumed about our calendars and our schedule. And one of our fears is that if we meditate, we might fall asleep. Sometimes it happens. Or that we might, we might meditate too long and be late for our next appointment. But there are, there are apps. For example, if you have an Apple or an Android phone, if you go to your apps market, there's a timer called Insight Timer. And you can set it for one minute, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. You can pick the bell that you want to hear that will mark the beginning of your time of contemplation and the end of your time of contemplation. But that helps remove the distraction about, you know, how long has it been? Have I, have I, have I meditated long enough or am I, going, am I going over? It'll eliminate that distraction. And then finally, practice meditating. You, you can't learn to swim without swimming. I know, I used to coach swimming, I used to teach swimming lessons, and you can show a kid a video all day long, but until they get in the water and start moving their arms and legs, they're never going to learn how to swim, and meditating is the same way. You're not going to learn the practice of meditation without actually meditating. And it's important to know that there are no strict rules or magic formulas to follow, but there are a few practices that have been reliable through hundreds if not thousands of years in the Christian tradition. The most important kind of meditation for Christians is called Lexio Divina. If you have been in my Disciples Path class, you've learned about this, you already know. If you have picked up one of my booklets in the back and read through it, it gives you a step-by-step -step instruction on Lexio Divina. But for those of you who are not familiar with this practice, you simply take your Bible and you pick a book in the Bible that you, that, that's particularly meaningful for you. If you don't have a starting place, I would recommend either the Gospel of Luke or the Psalms. And you open it up to the beginning and you get a pencil and you just read very, very slowly. That is, that is incredibly important. Imagine a cow chewing cud. You want to go really, really slow listening for God's voice. You're not trying to complete your one-year reading Bible plan. You're not trying to, to, uh, to show up your husband or wife that you read more of the Bible than they did. You're reading to listen for God's voice. And as soon as something strikes a chord in your heart or, or brings up a curiosity, Anytime you feel like God is getting your attention, you stop wherever you are. You don't read another word. You take your pencil and you put a dot on that word. And you stop. And then you begin to ponder. Why is God speaking to me through this verse? What is God trying to say? You get curious. You ponder it in your heart as Mary pondered in her heart the good news of the angel who told her that she would bury the Christ child. You ponder it, and then you enter into a time of conversational prayer where you're doing most of the talking and you're wrestling with what in the world is God trying to say to you and how might you apply it in your life. And you, you say, God, tell me, what is the one thing that I need to do today to apply this truth that you're speaking to me? And then you write it down if you have a journal. You say, I'm going to go and tell so-and-so that I'm sorry. Or I'm going to, to take, take three minutes every day for the next week to meditate. Or whatever, whatever God's saying to you, set a goal. And then here is where the meditation, the contemplation comes in. Whatever word or image that God uses to pluck the cord in your heart and get you thinking, you return to that image and you sit in silence, in solitude, 
You take a few deep breaths, releasing all of your distractions and all the things that are, that are cluttering your heart and mind, and you try to focus the eye of your imagination on that word or that image that God has brought to you in Scripture. And you just focus on that for five or ten minutes. Now, this might be very, very difficult at first because you're going to experience what the masters call monkey mind. You're going to have a flood of distracting thoughts and you're going to find yourself jumping from one thought to the next. And whenever you experience those kind of thoughts, you simply recognize them, you call them out, either in, in a silent internal voice or out loud, I'm feeling anxious. And you, you, you notice them without blame or judgment, and then you simply let them go and refocus on the image or the word. Okay? Uh, you can also do breath prayers. Has anybody here done breath prayers where um, you breathe in a part of the prayer that you say kind of in your mind, not out loud, and then you exhale the second part of the prayer? So one of the most famous prayers is the Jesus prayer. It's been around for a couple thousand years. And you breathe in, Lord... And then as you exhale, you say in your mind, have mercy. Then as you breathe in, Christ, exhale, have mercy. And then repeat, the Lord, have mercy. And you do that in repetitions, repetitions of three. If you're about to have a very difficult conversation with your boss or with your children or your spouse or you're anxious or you're dealing with things and you're in a bad place, this is a wonderful way to hit the reset button and try to get in a different place, a peaceful place where you can exercise wisdom. I will warn you, though, it's the absolute last thing that you're going to want to do. <laughs> you're going to want to argue and yell and scream and you know, assert yourself and accomplish your agenda. The last thing you're going to want to do is let go of ego when you're in the midst of all of that. But as your pastor, I'll tell you that it's the absolute first thing that you ought to do to get in a different position. And we learn this the hard way, don't we? We, I mean, we have the knee-jerk reaction, and we, we get defensive, and we, we, we let ego kind of drive the car, and every single time it drives it into a ditch, and we go, man, maybe next time I ought to meditate. And eventually, maybe after 30 or 40 years of practice, that might be your first response. That's the goal, right? To get that to be your first response. But breath prayers are helpful. Also, you might meditate on a meaningful image. Christians have meditated on images of Jesus in Scripture. They've meditated on crosses or crucifix or even beautiful icons. If you're a visual person, you can meditate on an image. Or you can meditate on something beautiful in nature, on the sunset or the waves that are coming in or the glitter of the, of the light on, on the little ripples that are coming in because we haven't had any waves in like two weeks. That's another thing that's making me have a bad day. Uh, if there are waves, everything would be better. So, you can meditate on something in nature. There's a, a spiritual giant named Teresa of Avila that, medica that meditated for a long time on an acorn and saw the beauty of God, the creator of the universe, in an acorn. But you might, cho you might choose to appreciate the beauty of a flower or a sunset or whatever the case might be. In all of these practices, what you're doing is you're sitting alone in stillness and silence and using your God-given imagination to focus your attention on something that will help you connect with the presence of God. And again, the biggest challenge is going to be distracting thoughts. But one of the most valuable lessons that we learn in meditation, one of the most valuable life lessons, and maybe this is the best reason to do it other than to connect with the presence of God, is that we can hold our thoughts loosely. I want to tell you a secret. Are you ready? You don't have to latch on to every thought. You ready? You don't have to act on every thought that pops into your mind. You see, in meditation, when we practice this detachment and we get some critical distance from our thoughts, and we kind of observe them from a more transcendent place in the presence of God, what we realize is that we're always having thoughts and we have a choice. We can either latch onto it and nurture it and water it and feed it and let it grow and take root in our heart and control our lives. And if it's a good thought, great. If it's a bad thought, not so great. Or if it's not something, because you know it says, Paul says in the Bible to meditate it's another time that you meditate on what is good and wholesome 
right? The good things that God gives to us. But when we recognize that what the thoughts that are popping into our head are not life-giving, they're not wholesome, they're not good, they're not life-giving, we have a choice and we can recognize them without blame or judgment. You don't have to beat yourself up and say, well, ego's really got me today and then start whipping yourself on the back. You can simply acknowledge the thoughts that you're having without blame or judgment and you can just take a deep breath in and as you exhale, just let it go. Don't hang on to it. Don't act on it. Isn't that beautiful? And as we practice meditation and we deal with this, these series of distracting thoughts, we're getting better and better and better and better at recognizing our thoughts, discerning whether they're good and life-giving or whether they're destructive, right? And either letting them go or nurturing them to our own spiritual joy. But what's most important is that you find a quiet place. You focus on just being in the presence of God. Don't make the mistake of thinking that meditation is just for the, the spiritual masters and the religious experts and the pastors. It's a gift that God gives to all of His children to heal our hurts and help us to grow up in the faith. And don't be overly ambitious when you first start either. Right, if you bite off more than you can chew, if you say, I'm going to meditate an hour every single day, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Start small. Be three to five minutes, and then you can increase it from there as you find it to be beneficial. So here's my challenge. I'm going to invite the band to come forward, and, uh, and I just want to issue this challenge this morning. I want you just for the next seven days, right? maybe start tonight and go through Saturday. For the next seven days, I just want you to set aside five or ten minutes for some meditation. Pick a time. Try to do it the same time every day. If it's in the morning or at night before you go to bed or your lunch break, whatever the case might be, set a time, just five or ten minutes, and meditate. And see what happens. What I have found that the more that I meditate, the more that I want to meditate. The less I meditate, the less I want to meditate. Does that make sense? And so give it, give it a good college try for six days <laughs> and see what that does to your heart and to your mind. If you will do that this morning, then I would just invite you to respond by saying amen.